The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code Sports of Anarchy 10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu Jitsu gear. We're also brought to you by the Flex Belt. Summer is approaching fast. And if you want to strengthen and tone your, your abs, the Flex Belt, FDA cleared, might give you those abs. I'm just saying. Follow the link in the description below. Get your very own. The MMA Discussion Podcast is now available to listen to on iTunes and the radio podcast app Stitcher, which is available, both of which available for free on all smartphone devices. So if you're driving around, you're thinking, oh, I want to hear Nick talk right now, you might just go to your phone and bam, there we are. That's all you got to do. We're on all smartphone devices, people. I know a lot of you have been asking because a lot of you only listen on YouTube, which is weird. Um, Yeah, we're on all phones, man. Listen to us. We are back, episode 26 of the MMA Discussion Podcast. My co-host, Chris Powell Yuga. Say what's up. I'm back, guys. He's back. He's back. And, of course, spitting hot fire today, Jonas. Say what's up, man. Hey, what's good, y'all? What is good? It's good to have. We got three of us now. Uh, this is going to be a good one. I feel I feel happy about it. We're going to preview 185, a lot of other news that's been popping up uh, since our last uh, podcast. We got... First of all, I want to bring this up. Uh, Mark Coleman, UFC Hall of Famer, the godfather of ground and pound, the man, essentially. Uh, one of my favorites all time. Um, right now, he's got this issue going on where he has an infection in his hip. He's going to need hip replacement surgery. Not only that, he's going to have to clean it out in there. He's got to have a lot of stuff done. Um, what's crazy about it is he's having a lot of financial issues. So for for now... Um, Wes Sims, one of the fighters, uh, one of the former fighters of the UFC who, uh, who trains with him, um, trained under him, all that jazz, uh, send up, uh, set up a GoFundMe drive, um, which you can go obviously on GoFundMe.com, look up Mark Coleman, just hit, just hit Mark Coleman. I'm sure it might also be in the front of the page last I checked. Um, and then of course, uh, he's, his goal, his goal is 20,000. And I got to say after the first day it was posted and when news hit that this was out, he his fans uh had already put out $10,000, which is half of the goal, which is incredible. Uh you got to that that's got to say something about your fans and of course Coleman uh reacted on, on camera and man it was just uh it was very heartwarming. So for anybody that wants to go ahead and uh help out Mark, I definitely will when I get the chance getting paid this week. I'll definitely put some in for the uh the Godfather. Um, again, just go to GoFundMe.com, search Mark Coleman. It'll be right there. Donate however much uh, you want to donate. I'm sure anything you guys would be willing to to get to help out, uh, he'd appreciate it. Uh, that's gotta suck though. For to, for to be a Hall of Famer, you would think you'd get like some kind of benefits from doing that, right? UFC, hook it up. I, exactly. What, what, just because you know he doesn't fight no more, you ain't gonna you ain't gonna help your brother out. I mean, he's he's your Hall of Famer. I mean, he was there in the early days, and he was one of the he was one of the first stars that they had next to Hoist. You know what I mean? When 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 Mark Coleman was in on those tournaments, man, people came to watch that dude beat some ass. You know what I mean? Um, he's just, he's one of those early pioneers, I, and and it's weird that guys like Hoist get more respect than a guy like him. And it's, you know, I mean, I think it should be fair and equal. Um, and the fact that this guy has the financial troubles that he has, he shouldn't even. For for being for doing what he's done for the UFC, for being as around for as long as he has, um, for main eventing as many cards as he has, along Pride and the UFC, um, it's just uh, that's very unfortunate in my opinion. And uh, like I said, uh, uh, I I'm gonna help him out. I'm gonna go ahead and donate my own amount, and I just hope that that gets fixed. Again, it's just an infection in his hip. He needs hip replacement surgery um, to fix all that, and that's just unfortunate. Uh, other than that, we'll move on. Again, though, Mark Coleman, hope you're doing good. We'll move on. One of the craziest signings that we heard, and Jonas, you know about this guy, Phoenix Jones, a.k.a. What's his name? <laughs> a.k.a. Ben Fodor, which is a crazy cool last name, I think, actually. Um, the Seattle superhero has been in MMA for about 10 years now or something like that, yeah, some yeah, crazy he, amount. He started, Even though he's only 26, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, he's a 5-0 and oh and one fighter with five wins, one draw. And, uh, you know, 
rumors had been coming out lately that he was going to sign with some kind of uh, promotion, and who who to thunk it? World Series of Fighting was the promotion. That's pretty crazy. You know, uh, they got a lot going for him right now. They got these. Uh, they got a, a new division coming out. They have uh, one of their most exciting stars in Justin Gaethje, uh, who's going to fight this month. And now they've signed um, this <laughs> this very very um, what's the word for him? We'll say enigmatic. Yeah, I was gonna. That's exactly the word I was gonna say. Enigmatic uh, man, who of course, uh, you know, uh, if you've heard of him, he's literally a, a dubbed superhero out in Seattle who who has stopped some crimes. And then you know, we'll, we'll read down some of the list of some of the things he's done on January twenty on January second, twenty eleven, in Linwood, Phoenix Jones stopped and chased a car uh, chased away a car thief as the car owner who has to be identified uh, stood by in shock as Jones ran into action. The, the news reporters introduced Dan and Phoenix Jones to one another the following Monday evening, Dan being the uh, the identified car owner. Um, Dan proceeded to thank Jones numerous times and da 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 And there's just – and the list goes on. He's got a lot of these where he stopped many thefts, many robberies, possible assaults. He's stopped a lot of these things from, from happening in costume. <laughs> Um, uh, what is it? Uh, he's, uh, and he's actually pretty, pretty mellow. He's also stubbed, uh, stubbed a couple drug deals, all kinds of things. It's pretty crazy. Um, and he's been signed to the World Series of Fighting. Now, I haven't seen this dude fight before, so I actually kind of want to. Um, so I, you know, that's very interesting. What do you think about this signing, uh, Jonas? Knowing that I know you know about him. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've heard about him. I heard about him way back in uh 2011 uh maybe even before that honestly uh he, he had been on he had been featured on a few uh programs with g4 uh talking about live real superheroes and whatnot so i mean this this really comes as a surprise to me but what i did know is that he actually did have an mma background and uh not only is he 501 professionally he actually racked up a 15 win two loss amateur career as well so we're looking at a total of about nine years, he got involved in MMA back in 2006, and uh, he's amassed a record of, you know, if you want to count all fights, 22 wins, uh, two losses and one draw. Two losses. Well, no, it's 20 wins, two losses, one draw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 20 wins, two losses, one draw. So, you know, we don't know who he's been fighting. But, uh, he's kept his fights strictly in Seattle, it would seem, even all of his pro fights. He's fought for the Super Fight League, which guys like Michael Page have fought for before. So, um, yeah. you know, some names have come from there. Yeah, so who's to say he won't be another one of them? We'll see. I mean, he's young. Uh, he's got experience. Uh, who knows what, what comes from uh, his signing with the World Series. But uh, the World Series could use some guys. They really could. They could use some guys that uh, have some kind of a following. Yeah. And uh, just, there's just no telling where this would go. So. Yeah, and we were talking uh, about this the other day where, you know, World Series of Fighting is essentially the number three promotion right now behind Bellator. And they got to make some moves. This, while maybe some people would seem a little silly, at the same time, it, it could end up being long term, I think, a, a good move for him. Depending on how this turns out, depending on how he turns out. He's a welterweight fighter and uh, that welterweight division of World Series is already pretty packed uh, as, as far as like... Um, you know, I would say as far as their their competition there, they got a lot of good guys in that division. Seeing him match up with some of them would actually be interesting. Um, again, I got to see his fights. I'm actually interested in seeing him. He's got two submissions, two decisions, and a knockout in his pro career. His amateur career is all mixed, mix and match, but uh, shows that he's uh he's he's, he's seemingly um decent and uh, he has a he has a brother carlos photo who fought uh who fought for both strike force and the ufc so i mean he's got obviously he's probably very well um in a in training and training camps and all that such so i i don't know it should it should uh be interesting to see how it works chris what do you think of this poll um i really don't know anything about phoenix jones so i don't have too much to say but i think it's really cool 
Yeah. <laughs> Got to do your research on him, definitely. And man, he's been arrested a bunch of times. I'm just looking at his rap sheet now. We have a superhero who's been arrested a bunch of times. Yeah. Well, well, sounds, you know, well for like. Sounds about right. No, but like, yeah, exactly. But he's Vigilante been. Atlanta is a bit illegal, so that's yeah. why he would be arrested. He'd been a, he's been arrested for breaking a, a man's arm who was assaulting a woman. He's uh, broken up a fight with pepper spray. All right, so yeah, at least he's being arrested for good reason. Yeah, so I mean that's that's according to this rap sheet. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really, I, I mean, I've heard of him before. I just don't know all too much about him. I see his record; it's impressive. I'm interested in seeing how he does in World Series of Fighting. I'll definitely be watching. That's for sure. Definitely. And uh, next time we talk about him, we'll try and be a little more educated on the on the guy. Because honestly, uh, I, I had known about him. I didn't know he was doing uh, MMA until about a couple months ago. Anyway, so. Um, yeah, definitely an odd sighting, but I like it. Uh, we'll see how they do. Mark Munoz is uh, uh, signed what might essentially be his final fight against Luke Barnett uh, going down. Which which fight is that? UFC Fight Night 67, I believe. I'll double check that, actually. But um, what do you think about the, the, the call to retire? I don't know if you saw that fight against um, Cal, Cal Monero. Yeah. Um, what did you think of that fight, Chris? Uh, the fight of Mark Munoz? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to really say anything too negative, but Ron Mark, I, I think Mark should, I think he should have retired after that one. It just wasn't good. He didn't, he had nothing to offer. And I, I think at this point, Luke's a young guy. He's, he's good. He's going to be a lot bigger than Mark longer. He's going to, I think he's going to get beat up. I don't think it's going to work out well for Mark in this fight. I think it's going to be a long night for him and he's going to retire on a loss. And that's unfortunate. We'll see. I mean, Luke Barnett himself is on a two loss, uh, two fight losing streak right yeah, now. Yeah, but so. the fight to the fight, I think he lost to Sean Strickland. That was clearly his fight, and they it was a bad decision on the judges' part. Got you. That was actually on a card where uh, Munoz was the headliner against Musasi. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not like he's being finished, not in the way Mark is. Yeah, I, I, I wonder if it's the same kind of thing like with Koscheck. Um, you know, seeing that, um, seeing that, you know, Koscheck had one more fight in his uh, contract, and then he's gonna fight uh, this Eric weekend Silva. or Eric Silva. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't think he should be fighting either. I think he should be retired. Yeah, well. we'll get into that. But as far as your opinion, we've already we've talked about it to some extent. But yeah, to talk that, to break down the fight is definitely gonna be interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I wonder if maybe that's why. Plus, the fight's going to be in the Philippines, you know, which I'm sure is something that of a of a dream come true for him to finish out his career right there if he can get the win, which I do hope he does. I like Luke Barnett; I'm a fan of his, but I, I've always respected and actually uh, liked Mark uh, as well. I mean, he's like one of the nicest dudes in MMA, in my opinion. And uh, you know, win, lose, or, or draw, that dude never uh, bad talks anybody. He's never, you know. He's never one of those guys to ever discredit anybody, um, and, and I appreciate that about him. He's a, he's a good he's a good dude, and so with that being said, um, as far as him going against Luke Barnett, yeah, I think he will have a hard time. I think you know he's got to be able to uh, really um, implement any kind of wrestling game he can. I think Luke is kind of weak there, but at the same time, he's shown some signs of being. Um, some signs of improvement re, uh, uh, as of late, but not. But in these losses, that's also kind of been one of his biggest weak points. So I mean, that's just something he's got to work on. Um, Jonas, what do you think? How do you see that fight going anyway? Yeah, it's a bad one for Mark again, uh, and it's a shame to see him go out the way he's pretty much sure to go out. But uh, you know, it's the fighter's curse. I mean, they these guys want to try to you know. Go out the best way they possibly can. Um, I don't think it's quite the same as Kost. I think Kostrick knows he's done. He's just trying to get it over with. Mm -hmm. But there's more on the line for Mark as far as, you know, again, as mentioned before, him fighting in his home country or, uh, you know, in front of his own people, which, you know, hey, nobody's going to turn that down. Nobody's going to walk away from that opportunity. So I, I respect him for that. And I, I you know, would encourage that he uh, at least – gets that benefit out of taking on another fight. But uh, again, he, he didn't look at, he didn't look good at all against Carnero uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, the ref <laughs> kind of let him get Oh, that him. asshole ref, yeah. Terrible stoppage. Mm -hmm. Terrible stoppage. I mean, it, it was clear as day that he was done. 
and you just let them hold on for too long. But uh, enough about that. Um, yeah, uh, Barnett's probably going to get the win, and uh, that's going to be it for Mark Munoz. We'll see, man. I hope not. I like him. I'm a big fan of him, and uh, that, that would just be unfortunate. And yeah, well, I mean, Mark Munoz himself has said that he would not enter a cage again after this fight. So Yeah, I mean, that's been plain uh, yeah. loud and clear. I mean, so it might not even be his last fight, but I am excited to see him again. I'm sure when the Philippines car was announced, that was on his mind, even though he had a fight scheduled. So, yeah, maybe but just the, 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 the venue has something to do with it. Plus, you know, of course, the UFC seeing somebody who is Filipino putting somebody on that card makes sense. Um, man, that card is going to be good. I can't wait for that, too. Favor and Edgar. Oh, so much yes. Yeah, that's going to be a hot card. It is, man. We're going to preview uh, UFC 185 now. Let's do that. Let's, let's just get that done because this card is awesome and I want to talk about it already. It's so good. First of all, Chris, um, I know that um, – what is it? Uh, is it you that's the like the huge mega fan of Anthony Pettis? No. No, that's not you? Oh, I'm thinking of somebody else. No. <laughs> that was you. Never mind then. Yeah. <laughs> but now hey, we'll start from this card from the from the bottom. This is an awesome card, I think. And uh, first of all, uh, I I think every card on the main card is something to watch. Every single main card fight has has something to it that is so exciting to 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 watch and think about. Uh, we'll just kind of scope through the, uh, the prelims. First of all, Sergio Pettis making his flyweight debut. That's something to watch right there. Um, I know the kid's young, and uh, how old is he? He's like twenty one still, right? Yeah, he's pretty young. God, I'm older than him. That's kind of creepy. Um, but but yeah, he's 21. Making how his, is that creepy exactly? I don't know. I just I never feel older than these guys because uh, I've always been coming up watching them. And they've always been older than yeah. me. It's just some. Sergio's like that. 21. He's only a year older than I am. <laughs> um, yeah. Anybody knows that Sergio always always fights on the same card as his brother? Yeah, that's like been a hookup he's been getting lately, huh? Yeah. Uh, he didn't. Uh, but it's still. Uh, what is it? Has he? The Henderson? Yeah. Really? Every card that Anthony's been on, Sergio's been on it as well. I know he was first? in the last one, but I'm not sure about the... No, I not think, the not in his, de- his not in his debut. Not in his debut. The Alex Caceres card, which had... No, Henderson it wasn't, himself. but I'm pretty sure that uh, every card that Pettis was booked for, and that Anthony was either booked for or been on, Sergio was on it. Uh, in the last couple of years, probably, probably, yeah. Yeah. I just had to back out of a fight recent or a few years ago, didn't he? Oh, that's right. Not huh? a few years ago, but last year. Yeah. It is interesting. Yeah, that's a hookup he's getting, sure, certainly. It, it helps both of them in the sense that they can train coming up together at the, you know, getting ready for one whole event. That's very beneficial when training partners get the opportunity to do that with each other, especially if they're brothers. Um, I like it. He's going down to flyweight, which flyweight could use some, uh, some, some star power right now. Uh, I like it, and uh, you know, before going, you know, he's undefeated at flyweight essentially because he was undefeated coming into the UFC, where at flyweight was which was his most you know, prominent division. He fought there more than any other division, and I'm excited about it. I think he's gonna do great. He's fighting Ryan Benoit too, a guy who, when you know, in his you know debut, won fight of the night. Um, hopefully, he makes weight this time. He missed weight that that uh, that debut of his, but um, uh, he's an exciting fighter to watch. I remember that fight. Uh, he's very scrappy. I think that makes for a bad combination against Sergio, but, you know, that just uh, – he's almost kind of like he's primed. But you never know. You never know when a guy coming forward just wants to go all out, and you never know if he hits you. So I think it will be a great, exciting fight. I think it I think it also might lead to a performance of the night at the end of the night. We'll see. Um, how do you see his performance at flyweight going, Chris? Um, I think he'll do well. I see him being able to win this fight. I think it's a very winnable fight for him, especially at flyweight because he's not a big guy. He's He belongs at flyweight, I think. I don't think he belongs at 35. We've seen in the past he does have, um, unlike Anthony, he has a bit more of an ability to get hit. He gets hit more often, but he is really exciting. I think it should be fun to watch regardless. Just watching Anthony or Sergio is always fun to watch. And, um... Yeah, he was even winning that Caceres fight until he got caught. He's a really good fighter. He's just been he he's been clipped in a few fights and he's been caught, but I don't think that'll happen here. I think he'll get the win, and um, I don't know if he'll find the finish, but I definitely see him coming away with the victory. Jonas, what about you? Yeah, he's gonna win. Um, the guy's 
just been on a tear. Uh, no matter what fight he's been in, uh, the guy looks good. He shows a lot of the same uh, tendencies and techniques that his brother shows. So, I mean, it's hard to beat. A guy like that is just very hard to beat. So, uh, Pettis gets the win pretty easily, I think. We'll see, man. I'm excited. At uh, On the preliminary uh, card, which will be on Fox Sports 1, I believe. Um, it actually says FX here. What? Oh, really? Yeah. It's going to be on um, FX. On UFC.com, it says FX Prelim. Oh, maybe it'll be on FX, people. Look that up. Get that ready. Um, well, that's crazy. We well, got a heavyweight bout with Jared, Jared Rorschaw, Josh, Josh uh, Copeland. Uh, lightweight bout with Darren Krishank making his return, which is unfortunate because I thought it, it would have been nice to see him get that rematch with KJ after it ended so uh, um, abruptly. Oh, yeah, abruptly with that eye poke and everything. And then yeah. – uh, Elliot, uh, Elias Theodoro, the Canadian winner of the Ultimate Fighter, uh, against Roger Narvaez. Ross Pearson, headlining against Sam Stout. That's a fight of the night candidate right there. Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Actually, I like that one. I I've, I would say Pearson just because he seems more um, more fired up these days about trying to get into them rankings these days. Uh, but we'll see. He's been very inconsistent at the same time. But so is Sam Stout. I think he's one of the most inconsistent lightweights. Inconsistent what? I mean – he was robbed against Diego Sanchez. I'm not trying to sound like the salty guy, but he he absolutely was. Oh, robbed. definitely. He absolutely was robbed against uh, Diego Sanchez. So I mean, the guy's been putting on some good fights. Uh, he did lose a legitimate fight afterwards, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, he I, knocked out Gray Maynard I, after that fight, and then he got knocked out by Al Quinto later on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There we go. Chris's there boy. Go. <laughs> How do you see that fight going, Chris? Is he still with us? I guess he's not still with us. Oh, we lost him. That's crazy. Jonas, go ahead while I, I uh, get him back on here. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, I don't know what <laughs> this kind of caught me off guard. Yeah, my um, bad. Don't worry. You better. Yeah, Ross Pearson, uh, Sam Stout. Well, Sam Stout, has he been consistent himself? I mean. No, oh my God. He's lost like, no. what is it? Okay, hold on. Let's look it up. I think he's lost win, lost win in his last few. Yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. Lo he lost his last one, won the one before that, lost it. Okay, so wait. Since 2011, he's won one, lost one, won one, lost one, won one, lost one, won one, lost one, four times, essentially. Okay. He has a, he has so a he's four and four in his last eight. Yeah, he, he has a streak in, what, three years, four years now? Unless you go by two fight winning streaks, he's never had a streak longer than two fights in the UFC since his debut in 2006. Yeah, okay, so. He, that's pretty bad. A, yeah, that, that's. Textbook inconsistency, inconsistency there. So yeah, yeah. Who knows, man? It's like pretty much. Uh, it's almost like Eric Silva. It's a lot like Eric Silva, if we're honest. He he hasn't put two wins together. So yeah, okay. Oh, I got Chris back on the call. Chris, are you there? Yeah, I can hear you guys now. Sorry about that. Cool, cool deal. All right. Um, I was asking you, how do you see the Ross Pearson Sam Stout fight going here? All right, we jump straight to that one. Yeah. Um, I I think Ross will probably come out with the win. That's gonna be a good fight. I don't know, Sam Stout. He's looked good in some fights, and then he's looked off. And same with Ross Pearson. I mean, he, as I predicted when we were talking about it, that Al beat him up pretty well. He did good on the feet against him, but I think Ross might be a little bit too technical for Sam to keep up with, even though they're both really good on the feet. Um. Yeah, I probably think Ross is going to come away with the win. Sam Stout hasn't seemed like, I don't know, he hasn't seemed like himself. He got beat up by KJ Nunes. He got put out quickly. And Ross kind of has a similar boxing style, and I think that's going to work in his advantage against Sam. Yeah, he's coming off that submission guillotine win over referee, what's his name? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Remember that, man? Oh, that was bad. You know yeah. you've been knocked out when you put the referee in a guillotine at the end of a fight. <laughs> yeah. Sam Stout hasn't really beat anyone notable in a while. He His last run was to Cody McKenzie in 2013. Then he beat uh, Carlos Fodor in 2013. But The brother of Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix's brother. Isn't that, uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, his last three... He's lost three out of his last five, and he's lost to an Dude, no, look at, if you look at his record, he's gone four and four in his last eight. He's one loss, one loss, one lost it and since 2011, yeah. um, which is crazy. 
Yeah. Uh, I think his biggest win, if you look at his career, I mean, probably Joe Luzon is probably his biggest win. Oh, yeah, definitely. This is his uh, most notable win. That was win. 2010. Yeah, and that's not and it's not like no disrespect to Joe Lozon, but I mean I'm just there's bigger names out there that he could have beat, you know. And um, I mean Joe Lozon's probably the biggest name he's fought. Yeah, Dude. and so that's a big win. Yeah. yeah, but it's just like you know, I mean I'm sure wins over some of these other guys would have gotten him bigger fights. But it's just he's been so inconsistent; it's ridiculous. Yeah, I think um, I think Ross is gonna take. So, this. but he lost his last fight, so odds are he. Uh, phew, you never know. I'm just saying. Um. We'll see, but yeah, I, I do favor Ross Pearson in this fight. Not not going off of you know silly you know stats like that, but just I would think uh, Ross is more technically sound. He's f more of a ferocious striker because Sam has never really. The thing about him is that every single win, other than the Eves Edward knockout, has been a decision. And it's because he can't. Um, he's just I don't know. It's just for some reason he can never get a, a finish inside the octagon. Um, and it's just weird. I don't know what it is. I don't know exactly what it is. His style seems proficient enough, but it's like he's not fast enough. Sometimes, sometimes he doesn't hit hard enough. Sometimes he's not. Uh, or sometimes he just gets wrestled a lot. And so it's just a bunch of different things. And um, and that's unfortunate. But I think that you know, uh, Ross is probably going to be coming in there more prepared, more ready, uh, in the stand up. And I think uh, also Ross probably poses some decent type of threat on the ground. But I mean, we'll see. That's that's kind of iffy to to really predict. But yeah, for me, I think I think Ross Pearson probably takes it uh, in a decision win. Um, Jonas, did we ever get your pin? We didn't, right? Yeah, I've I've, I've had Pearson. you chimed in. All right, cool. Yeah, we'll go on to the main card, which is awesome. First of all. Jonas and I talked about this last week, but it was announced about a couple weeks before the um, the fight. Uh, um, Henry Cejudo, who will be once again attempting to make weight at flyweight, uh, and there was a Las Vegas opening uh, for for odds are on Hen on Henry Cejudo making weight. You can literally bet money. If Henry sure Cejudo, yeah, you can literally bet money on if Henry Cejudo wins or, uh, or, or I mean, uh, makes weight or doesn't make weight. There's an opening on that, and the odds have him still just bare, a little lower, but still three to one that he will not make weight. <laughs> if he makes wow. weight, some people and they bet that he will that he he makes weight, they can make some money. I think he's gonna make weight. I think he, I think so too. I mean, he seemed very confident in the, in that, but apparently Las Vegas says they're confident he won't. Essentially, they're saying three to one. So <laughs> that's that's crazy. Yeah. And you could parlay that with him winning if he if the fight still happens and he wins. So, which is crazy. You can actually parlay it with a fight. Golly. God, I know. Man. If yeah, I, I, what I you know what you could do, which would be crazy, if you bet. On Henry Cejudo making weight, winning the fight, and picking um, Jedrzejczyk, the female fight, uh, challenger in the yeah, Coleman, yeah. to win, and that happens, uh, you're looking at 12 to 1 odds that you'd win if that happens. Right? <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Not that Henry in the fight itself is the underdog, but. Just the fact that he's make weight kind of, um, or that if he does or doesn't make weight, kind of um, it adds to the value of that parlay still, which would be ridiculous. You'd actually make more money though if you picked Chris Carriasso to win. Henry Cejudo makes weight though, and that those are the kind of parlays that you can make. That's crazy though. <laughs> That's very interesting. I for some reason Henry Cejudo to me looks like this kind of guy who has the personality of somebody that that really has an intense mentality, but he's a nice dude. He doesn't seem like he comes off con like cocky or, 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 you know, egotistical in any sense. I mean, and the guy was a gold medalist wrestler, gold medalist. Sarah McMahon's a silver medalist. This guy won gold, gold in the Olympics. That's pretty legit. And, um, you know, that's, that's also why it kind of throws me off that he, he wouldn't have more discipline having made the weight, but I, I think he makes the weight and I think he comes in this bout and I think he surprises Kerry also because Cejudo's last fight, he really showed off some really good boxing. I was surprised with, uh, with kicks that were able to set up combinations and, and he just looked great. And he's a, he's obviously he's wrestling his game, but for him to have won a whole fight with mostly his striking was very impressive. Uh, that was against Dustin Kimura. Um, I think it was on Fox card and, um, 
I don't know. For me, I got to say, I got to say Cejudo makes the weight, fights at flyweight, puts Carriasso, uh down in the, in the last round, third round. I think he gets a TKO off some ground and pound. Jonas, what do you got? Um, yeah, I've got Henry Cejudo um, just because he has better grappling. To, to me, he does. And uh, there's just not a whole lot that Carriasso can do, even though he did recently fight uh, Johnson for a title. Uh, he really only got that shot because there was just nobody left in the division to give to Johnson to you know defend his belt from. So uh, not that Carriasso is a bad fighter at all. I think Henry Cejudo's uh, just got more to offer. And he'll get the win. That's cool, Chris. Yeah, I gotta agree with both of you guys. I think Suhudo is gonna be able to use his wrestling, keep Cariasso down, keep him on his back, keep him fighting off his back, and I think that's gonna be where we see most of the fight taking place on the mat with uh, Suhudo on top. I think he'll come away with a unanimous decision, a pretty clear cut one as well. All right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see it. I want to be a fan of this guy. If he doesn't make weight, it's gonna be hard to, but um, I think yeah. he will. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see the, 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 the payout for if he does make weight. I am going to be interested in seeing how much Vegas starts hating themselves for <laughs> doubting this guy. Um, but we'll see. I, mean, I, think I would he bet makes, on that. Huh? I would take the odds. I feel pretty confident. Three to one, dude. Three to one, yeah, one to three, essentially, if you take that bet. Pretty good bet. You know, so like if you put like 100 down, you get like 300 back. Yeah. Make a little, make a little gas change right there. <laughs> Yeah. But see, that's why the parlays are exceptionally important because they they multiply your winnings by a lot. But of course, you have to really be um, smart about what happens and everything. And uh, so, I mean, we'll see. I don't know. I'm I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly uh, looking forward to seeing the weigh-ins now. <laughs> Some to watch. <laughs> People are gonna have their tickets on them, looking at it, looking at their parlay. They're like, is he on the dot? Is he on the dot? One twenty-seven. Ah! Oh, shit. <laughs> No, you know what I mean. That would be crazy. Um, so Nick, tell us, are you are you putting some down on this? I might. I don't know. I might. I don't know. I'm. I want to be confident in this guy. You know. I think I. I. I want to. I'm. I'm certainly following him on his Twitter and Facebook, and he's posted pictures of him looking in great shape. So, um, I think he might. I think he will. Um, he seems confident. He doesn't even seem to be letting the fact that that people are putting money down on it bother him at all. So um, I think uh, I think he proves everybody wrong. And he shuts somebody up, and yeah, I think I'll put some money down. All right. I think we'll. I think you'll get a confirmation on on that probably Thursday. <laughs> Thursday, you know, because I'm sure the lining thins out on Friday during weigh-ins, like the, like a couple hours prior. You know what I mean? So I, I might want to take it. I might want to. Yeah, I might want to take the three to one offer as soon as I can. So, um, we'll see. The lighting thins out. Yeah, it'll There's thin out. Just kind of like the Robbie Lawler thing, you know what I mean? The There's odds a period joke in there somewhere, man. I swear to God. What's up? The lining thins out. There's a period joke in there somewhere. <laughs> Why do you have to say that? Why? <laughs> We'll move on in a second once I guess my. See, this is this is why we're explicit on iTunes. Well, duh. <laughs> we could not contain ourselves. We're not, you know, if we were getting paid, I could contain myself, but we're not. We're doing this. Yeah, for, you that's know. probably true. We'll get there, but <laughs> the next fight on the card, money, Roy Nelson. Jokes. What'd I do? Give us money. We'll stop making crude jokes. I don't get paid either, so we gotta start making that Ariel Hawani MMA hour money. <sighs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah man. We will once the website pops back up in the in the population. But we'll see. Next fight on the card, heavyweight fight that I am a fan of. Roy Nelson, Alistair Overing. That is a great fight. First of all, at the there's another story of inconsistency with these guys because they're both three and three in their last six, both of them. Um and that's very uh and, but they, but with the division being as shallow as it is, it's very easy to come back. You know what I mean? Especially with Aster having come off a good win off Stefan uh, with that KO. That's pretty impressive. Um, other than that, he's lost, uh, you know, to Ben Rothwell, Brown, and Silva all by knockout. So, you know, the key is to hit that chin, apparently. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the best knockouts of 2013. 
uh, that up kick from Travis Brown. Oof. Yeah. But we'll, I, I like this fight in the sense that it tests both men in, 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 in different ways. Roy Nelson, first of all, he's going to have to deal with somebody that, um, that can really, you know, uh, tire him out in a sense because Alistair is very good at clinch fighting, hitting the body, really tiring guys out. Now, I don't think Nelson has bad cardio per se, but, um, you know, it, it doesn't seem like he's the most in shape fella, as you can tell by looking at him. But um, I don't know. I think that he possesses obviously the knockout power to, to put Alistair down. So I mean, if and Alistair's shown, man, you hit it that you hit that sweet spot, he goes down, man. And I'm not saying it's easy. I've never said that any fighter in the heavyweight division has a glass chin. I'm not saying that now. Um, but you know, it's just uh, it's one of those things, man. Where I think that you know it comes down to who gets the who who can who can implement the game plan first. And obviously, the game plan from from Nelson will be to hit him in the face. Overeem's might be a little different. A lot of people say he's going to stand with him. I don't think he will. I think Overeem's going to try and take him down probably get on top, use some ground and pound, tire him out a little, and then probably want to strike with him in the later rounds. I think that's the smarter way to go about it. So with that, I think Alistair implements that kind of game plan, but I think it goes all the way to the judge's decision because I don't think he's going to be able to finish Nelson. With that being said, Alistair via decision. Jonas. Uh, Alistair knockout. Roy's going to catch it. It's going to hurt. He, he's going he's to catch yeah. his chin? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I kind of, man... I don't know. I don't we'll know. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Right? I think this is the hardest fight to call. Yeah, I, on I the main think card. I agree with you because I could see Roy knocking Alistair out, and then I could see Alistair trying to grind out the same way he did with Drew. I don't know. It's really, it's all, um, it's up in the air with this one. I could really see it going either way. It's like a fifty-fifty shot because if yeah. Alistair stands for too long and he gets cracked once, he his chin has not looked too great, and he can go down at any time. But if he looks for the takedown, I think he'll be able to get it, and I think he'll be able to keep Roy against the cage if he wants to, and control where the fight takes place, which is what I think he should do. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's really hard to call. You look at all the other fights. There's kind of a there's kind of a sense of knowing you know where someone can win in, in a better situation. And this one, it's really anybody. It's it's whoever gets off first at this point. Um. Like I said, if if Alistair can avoid the cracks and, and implement his game plan starting off uh, from the fight, then he's going to look good. But if Roy Nelson comes aggressive and doesn't get taken down and or doesn't get clinched up too much, um, you know, I think he, he obviously has a very high chance of winning this fight. So it's going to be a good one. I like this one. This is a very good – I'm sure performance of the night bonus could also be coming from this one as well. Um because I, I it, it's very hard to believe that this hits the judge's decision, even though that's my prediction. I, I honestly think that it might not. So we'll see what happens. Next fight, one of my favorite fights on this card, um, for many reasons. But I, I told you this last week, Jonas jo Johnny Hendricks and Matt Brown. That's a fight, man. That's a fun fight. Chris, I'll, I'll let you go on this one first. All right. So um, I'm gonna go with Hendricks by decision. I think he's going to look to get this fight to the mat. I don't think he's going to stand too much with Brown, maybe a little bit early. But I don't think after that, I, I think he's going to look to get him down. I think he'll be able to. Brown's take down the fence isn't what Robbie Lawler's is, and he's not going to be able to keep Hendricks on the feet or at least try to pop back up. I think if Hendricks gets him down, Matt Brown's going to have a bit of a hard time getting back to his feet. And I see, that, I see Hendricks grinding this one out. Brown might be able to land a few good shots, but... Uh, while they're on the feet, but I think Hendricks is going to just overpower him, use his wrestling, use his strength, and keep the fight on the mat. Jonas. Yeah, um, it, it's really hard to call a fight that Matt Brown's involved in just because, uh, there, one, there's just no stopping the guy. You can't put him away. But uh, as Chris said, his takedown defense isn't nearly to the level of uh, Robbie Lawler's or uh, – really anybody that uh, Johnny's been up against. And Johnny has some incredible wrestling uh, chops, if you will. So, uh, you know, if you want to look at styles, um, yeah, you, I'd have to pick Johnny Hendricks in this one. But uh, if if things get crazy, if things, you know, if things don't go as planned for Johnny, then, yeah, Matt Brown could take the fight. I like it. My so prediction I, is this. I more with Hendricks, but... I'm not counting uh, Matt Brown out by any means. I, I um, 
Uh, this is another tough one. Not as tough though for me. I think Johnny's uh, going to be able to uh, keep this uh, keep this close, keep it away from. But at the same time, being in the clinch is one of the toughest things you want to uh, you you probably won't want to do with Matt Brown because he's very good in the clinch. He throws elbows, knees, all that stuff. Um, he's very fun to watch. There, he's of course aggressive, comes forward. I think Johnny's going to want to look to uh, grapple with him a lot. I think in some cases that'll make for a a uh, a slow pace fight in some instances of it, unless uh, John, uh unless Matt can keep distance. But that's kind of counteractive to his style, which is coming forward a lot. Um, at least as of late, you know, he's not a guy that goes backwards. Um, you know, unless he has to. So I mean, that's just the thing with Matt, with uh, Johnny. Johnny's going to want to come forward keep it on the ground if you can on top and and uh so it's gonna be an i I don't see this being an entirely too crazy of a fight but it it has the potential to be certainly um but i think that's that's upon um that's a that's more upon johnny wanting to to make the decision to strike with him in some cases which he could definitely if he sees if he sees that his striking is more effective than browns then i'm sure that's where he'll stay in which case i think uh you know if he hits a hard enough shot on matt it'll put him down i don't think it'll knock him out as, uh, but you know because matt brown's one tough sob um it's a good fight though <laughs> like it. i'm excited for it mainly because especially the winner could potentially get the 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 next title shot, which I love. I love that the division is so switched up because who'd have thought that a year ago, even that a possible title fight that we could be seeing later on at the end of this year, last year would have been possibly Matt Brown and Roy McDonald. That could potentially be the next title fight. I think if Matt Brown wins convincingly and dominantly, I think he, I think he could uh, get a title shot and then say Rory wins. That's the matchup that could happen, which would be crazy. You know what I mean? Um, that's why that's why the welterweight division has got so more so much more exciting. I like it. It's it's and, and I can't wait to see. We'll move on to the co-main event. The UFC women's straw weight title is on the line. And man, let me tell you something about this fight that that I need that I think needs to be said and debated about a little. And I think maybe it can wait till after we're done discussing the card. But I feel like. When a division starts, and the best proof of this has come from Ronda Rousey and Demetrius Johnson, when a, when a division starts, and someone just starts it by being so dominant, it really kind of dampers the mood of it to a degree. You know what I mean? Like Demetrius Johnson has been so dominant that you know people say flyweight is shallow, and the same with Ronda. People say that, that bantam women's bantamweight is shallow. And we've had this discussion, Jonas, where I don't think that that's the case. And for obvious reasons, you know, I've said it before. Um, yeah. And it's just not that I want Carla to lose or, you know, I'm not too big a fan of either. I knew Carla had, would probably win the, the ultimate fighter. It's it's not too much of a big deal who I, who I think wins this one. It is obvious to me that I think Carla will win this one with her wrestling. Her wrestling has looked incredible. She's worked with Olympic wrestling, uh, Olympic level uh um, the Olymp the U.S. Olympic team who's going to compete next year in the Olympics. She's worked with them in preparation for this fight, so you know that she's probably got her wrestling A game going into this fight. You know what I mean? Um, the thing with Joanna, for anybody that doesn't know how to say it, this is how I say it, and I might be wrong because I've never heard anybody just uh, say, I've said I've heard it said so many ways, including mine. So Jedrzejczyk, Joanna Jedrzejczyk. Yeah, I say it the same way as you. Okay, do. cool. Well, I, yeah, might I, be wrong because I. It, just it might be like wrong, but come on, wires. you you can't blame it. You can't be putting no, no, Z's no. and it Y's and like K's all over your name. That's messed up. Dude, God, you shouldn't be able to read that. Like it just looks like <laughs> someone just threw the alphabet. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to read that. Like the doctor vomited the alphabet on the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just like. Mixed up some words and they played Scrabble or something. Yeah, man. I'm Joanna <laughs> seems like, and she's such a good sport about it. People tell her no one can say your name. How do you say it? And she said it, and I still can't say it. <laughs> she's just she speaks great English though. For you know, so props to her, and she's being a good sport about her last name. She's just like, when I win the belt, just call me Joanna Champion. Just you don't even Joanna Champion. So I don't even mess with my last name. It's fine. <laughs> Which I think is hilarious, but she's she's cool about it. And I've looked at a lot of her latest fights come in preparation for this podcast we're doing right now. And I gotta say, man, she like uh, she's she's got an amazing 
uh, striking style. I don't think her last fight against Claudia Godella was her best at all. Um, I think she's looked much more impressive in the past. And, and maybe it's just because it was Claudia Gadella. Opponents certainly uh, can impact h how you look in there, of course. And Claudia Gadella being a, a very, uh, you know, a, a very worthy competitor in this division at 115. And she dropped her and fought off her wrestling. It was a close fight. Um, but just looking at all of her other fights, she is a wicked kickboxer. She's got such... Uh, devastating elbows. She's good with leg kicks. She mixes it up. She likes to kick the body a lot too. Um, and she's just and she had a stellar year last year, winning four in a row. Uh, that all being said, I think Carlos Sparza uh, is too well prepared. First of all, she's also more experienced. I think uh, you know her striking. I think Carla can't stand with this chick. That's certainly one thing. This is one of those things where it's a clash of styles because I think if Carla even it tries to stand with her for say maybe more than a round she's going to be in trouble and i also think that if carla can get it to the ground joanna is just not going to have a good day it's it's it really is about uh it really that first round really will dictate the pace of how this fight goes i really think and if you know um if if carla can't get her down that might that might just that might really tell the tale of the of the whole fight. So Joanne, jo it's that's the big question: Can she stop the takedown? Because there's no way, in my opinion, with Carla's latest fights and any of them, she can stand with this chick. I don't think that that is possible. But I also think that if Joanna can't stop that takedown, she might not get back up. You know what I mean? With that all being said, yeah, I gotta go, with Carla. I think maybe she gets a fourth or fifth round finish because I don't think uh, Joanna is is too, uh, you know. I don't think she's too well groomed for five round fights. So, with that being said, because all of her fights either end quickly or she's or, or you know they go to three round decisions. She's never been in a five round, twenty five minute fight before. Um, so we'll see, man. I I actually like this fight. I, um, but the thing I was explaining earlier was uh, I'll get into that later. Go. I want to hear your predictions, Jonas. Go ahead. I'm going with Carla. Uh, the Cookie Monster. Yeah, I'm going with Carla. She's uh. You know, I think she wants to hold on to that belt for quite a while, uh, and I think she can. Uh, Joanna, she's really good at striking, as said, as pointed out before. Uh, she's really good at striking, but um, I think Carla has more. Uh, I think she's got more uh, potential to uh, dictate where the fight goes. And uh, I mean, if you look at what she did to Rose Namajunas uh, at the uh, TUF20 finale. I think it was CF20, but whatever it was, when that the inaugural uh, strawweight title fight, gosh, Carla just looked unstoppable. Unstoppable. Had her way with Rose. And I think she's going to do the same thing to uh, Joanna. So that's my pick. Chris? Yeah, I agree with basically everything both you guys said. It's going to come down to Carla's wrestling. I think, it, I think she'll be able to get Joanna down and I thought Joanna lost that last fight to Claudia Gadella. I'd actually be more excited about Gadella versus Sparza, honestly, because I want to see what Claudia would be able to do off her back if the fight wound up going there. But uh, Joanna's shown pretty decent takedown defense in the past. It's not the best, but it's not bad. I don't think she'll be able to stuff a Sparza's takedown. She might be able to stuff a few, but eventually it's going to get to the bat. And uh, I think Carla will wear her out after a few rounds. And then I think she might be able to find the submission somewhere in the later rounds. I agree with everything you guys said. I'm going to go with Carla. Yeah. And before we get into the main event, my thing was this, is just that I think starting a division with somebody who's so dominant really hurts it in the sense that many people have always underestimated the rest of the division just because of the the champion is so dominant. And this is the thing I was yeah. saying with Ronda following the 184 pay-per-view was that you know, people were telling me that, oh, she can't be a legend. She won't be a legend. She won't be a Hall of Famer. She won't be any of these things because of the fact that her competition is so, yeah. You know, and yeah, I, 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 I disagree with good. that. Yeah, exactly. That's my point. Yeah, exactly. And it just yeah. drives me crazy when people tell me like, that. I, we've seen Kat Zingano. She's a black belt in jiu-jitsu. We've seen her compete in jiu-jitsu. She's not a black belt. Belts. Okay, don't do this again, Chris. Is she a black belt? No, she's what not. She's fuck? a purple belt. What the fuck? Dude, I, I'm tired of you. This is ridiculous. You can't be doing say, this, man. I just say everyone's a black belt. I gotta, like... Um, you think anybody that gets a submission in MMA has a black belt? I think that's your thing. No, we're only <laughs> Brazilians. 
Let me see. Yeah, purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. All right. Well, we saw her in tournaments and she looked good. No, yeah, she's definitely she's a compete. I'm, listen, Some she may be a purple belt. I think belt. I'll say this. I, I saw someone say she was a black belt. I, I might. They I were wrong. Mistaken, but they I, were I'm horribly, definitely wrong. Horribly wrong. I, I know I'm wrong, but I don't know why I keep saying people black belts. This is the second time, but the Lineker one, I had a good excuse. He's Brazilian, so. Oh, yeah, such a good excuse. That is a good excuse. You come out of the womb, you have, like, a white belt on already, huh? That's just how it goes. <laughs> in the, <laughs> for, Can you at least agree on this? Aren't about 98% of Brazilians black belts in jiu-jitsu that compete in MMA? Maybe. I don't know if it's that high. I would say maybe, like, 80. They claim to be. I would say, least, I would say like, 80. Uh, no, it's more. It has to be more than that. I maybe. I don't know. You're really going to make me look this up at some point. I'm going to do the research and everything, and Dude, I'm going to find name, out. Name, like, three Brazilians in the UFC who aren't black belts. All right, well, John Lineker, um, <laughs> that's the first one because we did the research on him. Um, who is it? It's a heavyweight. I'm trying to remember his name right now. It's a heavyweight Brazilian. Junior's uh, not. Junior Dos Santos is not a black belt. Is he not? A, I thought he was. Not. I want to know. I think he is. I think you're full of crap. He must have just got it then because he certainly didn't come into the UFC with a black yeah, belt. Yeah, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Yuri Car- Carlton. See, it's very hard, though. It's very hard to think of three, only three Brazilians in the UFC who aren't black belts. So, who on cool pots? Oh, that's another cool. one. And um, Yeah, but he sucks. <laughs> 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 oh man, he said it. I didn't say it, Juan. If you're listening, uh, well, <laughs> you realize I asked this guy to be on our podcast. Uh, Why? What? Okay, <laughs> fine. I won't. I'll discredit that invitation. Juan, I'm sorry, but you can't come on to our podcast now. No, I just said he sucks. Why are you gonna do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I can't have him suck, on now. Like, you suck for the UFC. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it's not like I would add, ask David Kelly to come on here. That's no bueno. That guy should not be in the UFC. But that's it's the thing is that, you know, uh, that's what we were t- – back to the subject about uh, the competition. Everyone, I'm just joking. The guy yeah, this is all jokes. I mean, if anybody's UFC. taking us too seriously right now, you need to calm the fuck down. We're not getting paid again. <laughs> yeah, really. you know, if we I were mean, he serious. obviously doesn't suck. He made it to the UFC, but he didn't look so good. <laughs> that's yeah. all I got to say. But with, but with you know, Cass and Gano, Misha Tay, Sarah McMahon, Holly Holm, uh, even Bash Correa – um, even Shayna Baszler when she when she was coming in, um, yeah. you know they they all had they all had an, a career, a lot of experience, a lot of highlights, a lot of good moments. They'd been around a while. If and I was explaining this, if Ronda Rousey didn't exist, first of all, take take away the fact. Say women's MMA got into the UFC without Ronda Rousey, um, there probably wouldn't be somebody as prominently famous as her right now. But I think that division would be so much more competitive that it'd be one of the most exciting to watch. And I think that title would be changing hands a lot. And I think that you know there'd be a lot uh, there'd be a lot more interest in the division more so than just the champion, which there is. There's so much more um, attention on her than anybody else in that division that you know people don't pay attention to really how good the fighters are in that division. I think yeah. that the UFC strawweight division is one of the best. I think it's comparable to like the equi- it's the equivalent of excitement and skill and technique and all that meshed into one to men's welterweight in my opinion. Um because I think that the 115 pounders have, you know, are are the best suited uh to for combat. So and with that I, I just believe that, you know, I not that I am not a fan of Carla uh so I don't care if she wins or oh I care, but I don't Really, it's not like I have somebody I'm rooting for. I just want to see a good fight with this one. But I would like it if the title changed hands some. It would make this division very uh, interesting. It would uh, it, it would bring a lot of intrigue to this division because it wouldn't there wouldn't just be another just dominant women's champion. Which if Carla yeah. can comp- if Carla can do that if she can just go on and win all these fights and stuff, it's not like I'll demean her. That's good for her, and she's obviously one the baddest chick at 115. What else can anybody say? I'm yeah, just saying that that's what I would hope for. You know I, mean? I don't think she has the same level of dominance as someone like Ronda or Demetrius Johnson. But I also don't think – like the girls at 115 are good. Yeah. But I don't think they're the same level as a lot of the other divisions. I like, think I – oh, think, I disagree with you there. I think no, they're I probably think, the best I, one. I honestly think they're probably – I think they're the, they're, they're, the, they're the best division next to 135. I think that the UFC is smart. Not, not, even, 
wait, you're saying the 115 women's pound division is the next best division to what? To 135 probably. Or one uh, 105. At the, I think the top three divisions are 105, 115, and 135. There's no 105 in the UFC. What are you talking about? I'm, I'm not in the UFC, but in MMA, I mean. I disagree. Why do you disagree? Uh, we'll I, get into that after the main event. I think that's a good yeah. conversation to have. But right. um, but that's the thing is that you know that but you understand what I'm ta- I'm saying is that I would like to see uh, you know uh, uh the, the titles change hands for it oh, to be yeah, exciting, kind of like how welterweight is right now. That's why I was. Yeah, no, th- I, I I get what you're saying completely. Yeah. I just I don't know if Carla's that type of dominant champion, but I just don't think the competition below her is good enough to beat her. Not many of them, at least. Uh, under Ronda. No, under Carla. Carla, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I agree there. She, I mean, and she hasn't been around too long, but she's obviously been long around uh, around long enough to, to show that she she yeah. she has the potential to be like one of I the just, best. And it's why I want Jessica Aguilar to come over so bad. She's oh, at yeah, World Series of Fighting and fighting and she has cans. Win over Carla. And she has a win over her. Yeah, I know. That's what. I, oh, I would love to see that rematch, and I hope it happens someday. I hope the the World Series of Fighting puts out and gives it to her, and. Um, that sounded dirty, but <laughs> gives the <laughs> UFC <laughs> Jessica Aguilar, um, and I would love to see that rematch. We'll move on to the main event so we can get into some topics that I think that the, the rest of the fan base would be interested in hearing about. Um, Anthony Pettis versus Rafael Dos Anjos. Let's just say I think Anthony Pettis is the better striker, while I do think that Rafael Dos Anjos is the stronger striker in the sense that he attacks uh, more aggressively. I think that if he hits, it hurts more. Um, I think that if he's coming forward and he's being tactical, he's going to attack everything, such as the leg, that body, and head. Some trouble. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think he's a, I think he's a very imposing opponent for, for, for Pettis. Somewhat like Gilbert was, but Gilbert isn't. You know, uh, like a bona fide knockout artist like this. No, I'm like, saying I think that can get Dos Anjos into some trouble. No, I definitely can. I was going to say to my point was that I think Pettis' counter-striking has improved. It wasn't like the greatest thing back then. That's why he was more the aggressor back in his back in his WEC days, for example, uh, for Pettis. But in that Gilbert fight, he showed such a good counter-striking uh, game that uh, that I was like, wow, the improvement is there. And uh, it's, very, uh, it's very important to note going into this fight, if Rafael doesn't, uh, you know, keep himself uh, safe and, and, and aware at all times, he's going to get caught with something. And, uh, and, you know, that's the thing is that I think Pettis will, will be more cautious. I think this fight hits the later rounds because I think Pettis is going to be uh, um, more, what's the word, uh, patient in this in this fight. And I think uh, Rafael will at some point try to initiate a ground game in which I think we'll see some fun scrambles. So all together, this is going to be a great fight. I, I'm excited for this main event. And, man, I'll tell you this. I think Pettis has what it takes in him to be one of the greatest champions ever. Because he he looks so good, he makes it look so easy, he makes it look so fun and exciting and stuff when he gets in there. And I think the reason that he's not as big a name right now is simply because he doesn't fight as often. He's always injured and stuff. But I think if he was fighting like three times a year, he'd be one of those guys you just always hear about, always talking about. Can't wait to see again. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that this fight, this main event is very underrated. I think uh, it's going to be exciting, and I think it's going to have a highlight finish at the end of it with uh, Pettis. Winning in the later rounds by probably knockout. I don't see him submitting Dos Anjos. With that being said, Jonas, hit your result. What do you got? Pettis. Pettis by uh, decision. All right. Decision. Yeah, wow. Decision. When's yeah. the last time he's gone to a decision? I think he hasn't gone to a decision uh, since Clay Guida wrestled him yeah, uh, to exactly. the defeat. Yeah. It's been a while. That was like in 2012 or 2011. Yeah, that was a, that was a few years ago. Yeah, let me look it up. Not too many fights ago, because as we've said, he he's been injured and such. But Chris. Yeah, I think um, uh, Pettis is gonna take this one from Dos Anjos. I don't. I've seen I've seen Pettis has, has marked improvements in his takedown defense. Guys are trying to get him against the cage, keep him there like Gilbert did. Uh, Benson was going for. He, he was Anderson Silvying it by going to the cage and then just using it to keep the, the you know to help with his defense. <laughs> I, I thought that was impressive. Really, yeah, he wasn't really going to the cage. I mean, Gilbert was trying to force him into the cage with his hands and then shoot for takedowns. Ben was trying to clinch him against the cage. I mean, this guy's really improved his takedown defense ever since that Guida fight, and then he's been able to strike back when guys are coming at him like that. I think that might be the best way to come at him, just because if you 
if you try to just stay in a regular striking range with him, he'll catch you a lot easier. Mm-hmm. But there isn't much you can do. I mean, I don't think Dos Anjos is wrestling is good enough to take Pettis down. And I think he's going to wind up staying on the feet. And I don't think it's going to turn out good for Dos Anjos. I could see a knockout coming in the second or third round for Pettis. I like it. This is going to be an awesome card. I'm excited. Woo-hoo-hoo. Get chills, man. This event looks great. Of course, uh, the best event that, that looks like it'll just steal the hearts of many is 187. That card looks great, oh, man. Oh, by far. I can't wait till that comes out, but can you believe there's like yeah. there's like five events from, from this Saturday till that event, which is kind of pisses me off. Yeah, um, they have some uh, fantastic events coming up. Yeah, man. Uh, I can't wait for the summer to hit, man. It's going to be great. 186 is ridiculous, too, I think. Yeah. Jonas, you can go ahead and feel feel free to chime in whenever, but I want to get into you with this uh, with this women's division talk. Oh yeah, no, I just okay. I don't well, first of all, I want to hear what what do you think is the best division in women's MMA right now? In women's MMA or just MMA? You're talking women's about? MMA. Oh, women's MMA. That was um, that was the t- topic that we were talking about. No, I thought you meant like I was comparing it to every division in the UFC. Yeah. What? The- I was saying that 115 is one of the weakest divisions in all of MMA right now. In all, like men and women? Yeah. Oh, you silly bitch. Obviously, it's one of the strongest in women because there aren't really much others. Okay. You should just feel silly right now. (laughs) Why should I feel silly? First of all, well, first of all, because you made the mistake of thinking that's what I was talking about. Secondly, in women's MMA, I think it is the second best division. And oh, yeah, so do I. Okay, well, then what the hell? I thought you were talking about an all of MMA. I thought you were comparing it to, like, men's one. I'm not trying I... to compare it to men. I don't want to. Whenever I do that, people will say, yeah, they suck in this and that and the other. And I don't even agree with that, but at the same time, I, I don't want to argue it because, you know, yeah, no, it's I different. It's I, men and women. Um, I said I, in comparison to, like, the other divisions in the UFC, I don't think it compares. But in comparison to other women's division, it's right behind 135. Why do you think those two divisions are in the UFC, obviously? Yeah, they have the biggest names with the best athletes, I think. That's exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, I was just comparing them to every division. Well, that's still kind of rude to say to, to compare to all these other men's divisions that they're, like, the, like the worst division. That's kind of sick. No, I don't, I didn't, I'm, I'm just saying they don't have the – He's talking about depth. He's not talking about – yeah, he's just talking about depth here. Depth in what case? Like, what, what do you mean? They don't have, like – Behind Carla, there aren't a lot of girls who can really compete. In other divisions, there are more so people underneath who you could see competing with the champion, or at least doing something like that. And not every. I division, totally yeah. disagree with that. I don't. I don't agree not with that. Not every division, but there are a lot more divisions. Yeah, I mean, look at look yeah. at middleweight and welterweight and lightweight. All lightweight. those divisions. Featherweight. They're deep. Now you want to talk about a division that's not deep in men's. Let's look at 125. That's not deep at all. Heavyweight. I disagree yeah, with the flyweight not being deep. It's deep. In, it's not deep. Yeah, it's not it's deep as going past like the top ten. No, no, no. Back it up a second. Back it up a second. Flyweight is, I guess you could say, deep in terms of people who can fight each other, but it's not deep in terms of competitors for the champion. Uh, totally. Exactly. That's the point I'm yeah, making. That's, that's, that's where that's people make thing. the wrong comparison. They think that the champion and the division – are you know are you know one and the same and they're not especially in in Demetrius Johnson's case because he's beaten so many guys same with um with uh what is it uh, John Jones in a sense same with uh, Anderson Silva midway through his reign same with uh George St Pierre in his case people said that those divisions weren't deep in some cases maybe they weren't but uh some cases they were but they didn't want to say that because the champion was so dominant and I think that flyweight is deep especially when you got guys like Chico Kames coming up Hilson Reyes. Timothy okay. Elliott, Dustin Ortiz, Mikoski possibly going to fight for the title if he wins. I don't Dotson think again. any of I those guys can beat Demetrius Johnson. I'm not saying that they can. I'm just saying that they have a, that they have an opportunity and chance, in my opinion, to get to that point at some point. I'm not saying that they beat him. Um, that's a topic for another day. Um, but that, that's the problem, though. Somebody has to fight Johnson. All right. Well, I think that some. I think <laughs> that can. Right. You know what I mean. Yeah. Dude, they're giving Chris Carriasso a title shot. They're giving Horiguchi a title shot. They don't have guys. Yeah, they I blame John Lineker for that. If John Lineker hadn't screwed over, you know. Um, yeah, but who 
is behind him. They don't have the guys who they're just giving guys title shots because they have to keep DJ active. They have to, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. They That's a problem. That is a problem. Well, I mean, it's a problem mainly because you know people don't re- like see these guys recognize him too much. Or Gucci is on what a five fight win streak. That's pretty impressive in itself. Oh yeah, no, it is. It's not that it's not impressive. I think. I think these guys are fantastic fighters. When people tell me they don't like watching the flyweights, I think they're ridiculous. But the thing is, is there aren't a lot of challenges for Demetrius Johnson, especially now. He's beaten Benavidez twice. He's beaten McCall. And he beat John Dotson. John Dotson's basically the only guy really left at this point who I could see having a good shot at beating DJ. But he's hurt. Yeah. Well, he's not hurt. He's going to fight uh, well, Mikofsky. At, no, yeah, he's going to fight Mikofsky, which... You know, I think winner out of that comes out, winner that comes out of that fights DJ next. Oh yeah, 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 John, yeah, John Dawson's peg. They they're pretty much setting that up for him to get the title shot. Well, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I think Makovsky can surprise some people. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think he beats John Dawson, and that's just gonna eliminate another contender there. I don't think that was. Yeah, smart. but you're looking too far ahead at this point. You don't know. You don't know if Makovsky can win, and plus you don't know what Chico yeah, Kamis and Hilson has. Yeah, but irrespective of who wins that fight, I think it eliminates another contender in a division that needs contenders. Well, I don't know, but you that's know, as, as far as the kid, that is a problem. I'm just saying that you know that's the problem mainly with that I was bringing up with Carla is that you know dominant champions make these divisions a, a lot harder to talk about. But you can't deny any of these guys' skill. They are b- the best guys that fight at these weight classes, and not only that, they they have such an, a, a, a high amount of skill. I say the same thing for the straw weights. I think the straw weights. That was the point I was trying to make. All of those women on that top fifteen. Are all very skilled. I could say something about all of them. Joanna, who's number yeah, one, no, is crazy. They're skilled, good. but I don't think they're in comparison to even 125. I don't think a lot of them hold the same skill level in just in respective to them. Not obviously. I don't think more of them do. I think uh, some of them do. Yeah, no, some of them. Some of the top girls definitely. They're definitely high level athletes, but then there's some of them in that top 15 because the division doesn't have a lot of names. But I don't like that we're comparing them to men. If we're comparing it to other women, yeah, but no, we're not comparing them in a fight. We're comparing them in respect of their skill level to their division. Yeah, and and that's a fair comparison to make. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree with that because I was I was even saying Jonas, you'll remember I I was saying this about you. I believe that women's MMA right now is in the, the 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 kind of the kind of space where you know the UFC fighters were back in like the mid early 2000s you know yeah. like uh because there's a lot of women that come into the sport with one major skill set Carla came into it with wrestling Ronda with judo Holly with boxing Joanna with Muay Thai Claudia with Brazilian jiu-jitsu Jessica Pinay with jiu-jitsu Rose with uh kickboxing she did a little bit of kickboxing amateur when she was younger uh Felice Herrig with kickboxing you know a lot of a lot of C.O. Ham with kickboxing and judo, and then and then uh, you know just uh, Sarah McMahon with wrestling. This, they all come into the sport with one great style, and then they adapt to everything else. That's kind of how like the like the UFC was back in like the early two thousands. Everybody was coming in with their own special style, coming from wrestling or or judo or jujitsu or, or or something, you know. And then they adapted to all these other styles as as time went on. And I think that that's the trend right now with women's MMA. And they'll eventually get there. And I think, oh, yeah, absolutely. you know, and you and I know that people would say, you know, if you look back at the early 2000s, there were fighters that fought that were great, that had skill. Nobody diminished any of them because that was the top level of skill back then. And I think that it's the same deal with women's MMA because they got to catch up. They got a way late start and um, on, on, on MMA in general. And I think it's because of that that, you know, they that some of them don't look uh, aesthetically technical or, you know, as, as, you know, as, um, as, uh, you know, on the marquee skill level as the men. Um, I think that will change someday. Um, I think it'll probably that be will, another decade or so, but I think will, that that will change someday. Ball, just like it did with men. So I agree with you there. Totally. Yeah, yeah. I think it'll no, happen. MMA, and so, MMA for women is more of a, a niche right now. It's not like, it's not really gro- – I mean it's definitely growing because of the exposure it's been getting recently mm-hmm. with the UFC taking in the divisions. But think about just over a year ago when there weren't women's divisions in the UFC. There weren't as many women pining to compete. So these are those women who were competing before women's MMA was really taken at a, in a high light. Yeah. Now that it is, there are more girls coming up. So I think it takes time over years 
that they're going to develop these younger girls who are coming up. Looking yeah. To a decade from now, when, women's MMA, who It still may be, I mean, it could be behind just because men's MMA could still get that much better. But in comparison to now, we could see in a decade that the girls are starting to catch up. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is I think that's yeah, something. no, I definitely agree with that. This, yeah, I mean, and that's what I'm saying. But I'm saying because of that, there's no reason to say that Ronda Rousey can't one day be a legend. And that's just oh, no, that's I the thing that she, people dispute with me, and that's annoying. Yeah, no, I I know exactly what you're saying. I've had similar disputes in on the same exact subject, and just I think that it's ridiculous not to see her as such, just because of how much better she is than everyone else. That she's on the level that we may never see again from another woman or even just in general. She's been able to dismantle these girls who have been competing for a long time. Like when you look at Misha Tate, she's been competing for a very long time in MMA. Yeah. Girls like her, girls like Sarah Kaufman. We've had these girls in MMA for years and she's just been able to go out there, take care of them quick and that's it. And I don't, th- and she's just been that, that level of dominance has never been achieved by many other people and I don't think it ever will be again as in the women's divisions. I'm looking at Misha t- I just wanted to look up her uh, her profile and stuff. She's twenty eight. Wow, she's very young. Misha Tate is twenty eight and she fought started fighting in two thousand seven. Her made exactly. an amateur That's debut in two thousand six, which was nine years ago. That means she was nineteen yeah. when she started fighting. Damn. Yeah, she's been around for a decade and I mean obviously she wasn't fighting like most high level people all the time because nah. they weren't around they're still not around in terms of women's divisions it's just going to keep getting better but still she's been around for a long time and ronda just comes in and handles her there's something to say about that yeah definitely it's it's definitely one of these conversations that i wish i could have with certain other people but just heed what i'm saying women's mma you know if you look back at you know the guys chuck fought i'm not saying any of them are bad but i would say around that kind of level is where women's MMA is approaching. You know what I mean? And people look at Chuck like he's a legend, you know, because that in that day, that was the best that it could be. And right yeah. now, women's MMA is at the best that it can possibly be. And I got to tell you, it's pretty exciting to watch. It's to, to, to call, to, to, to see grow, to all of that stuff. Yeah, I think at times that's, li- um, that's uh attributed to a lack of technique in some areas because some of the women you'll just see them go out there and just start swinging at each other and they're not big so a lot of times they're not going to go down and you just see them brawling it out sometimes it's that that's the annoying thing is that you know back in the day that's what you'd see a lot of back in the day but you don't see that too often now so that either makes people think oh yeah every woman's fight exciting even though there's a lack of technique just because it's a brawl and then on the other end of the spectrum it thinks it makes people think oh no girls have any technique they just go out there and brawl so it's both ways it works both ways yeah it's just annoying (laughs) yeah no i think i think both ways are annoying i think people who think the women's divisions are better than every other division are annoying and i think people who think that they're they're not talented are annoying yeah and i hate that so annoying. There's a lot of changes going on, you know, and I'm glad to see some, but I, I just hope to see others kind of changing with the, with with the way things really are, you know. And you know, another thing that me and Jonas were talking about as far as change goes is these rule sets to uh, we were gonna bring this up, uh, performance enhancing drugs. And me and Jonas were actually talking about it. And Jonas now, um, you know, he had first of all, I had always had this idea before he was even announced at that press conference that there should be like, you know three to four year bans. Sure enough they, they decide on two to four years bans and now um Jonas has actually come up with this idea that I think is that you, you that you think you gotta hear. Go ahead and spit it, Jonas. Alright, here it goes. So, you know, I I got this basically from seeing uh what Matt Brown had to say about PEDs and the recent uh uh policy on that with the two to four year ban. He said five years. I'm like, well cool, you know, five years that would take somebody out of title contendership. Wait a minute. Why don't we just eliminate them from title contendership completely? Why don't we just uh, put a policy in place that, you know, if they get popped for PEDs, if they piss hot, then let's go ahead and just say they will never be eligible to fight for a title ever. They can compete all they want, but they can't reach the ultimate goal. They can't fight for a title because they've cheated. And uh, I think personally that that would completely 
well, not completely, but it would severely, severely impact the use of uh, performance enhancing drugs in the MMA. I think because yeah. uh, you know that's what people, that's what fighters come to do. I mean, say what you want, you know, some fighters just like to fight, but they're they're there to win a title. They're there to uh, claim that title and be known as the best in the world. So if you take that away from them, sure, that that would be the ultimate incentive to never ever use performance enhancing drugs. Yeah, the only the only problem I see with that is that some of these guys they're just gonna look at it and like, shit, all right, I can't get a title, but. I can still keep fighting. I can still keep making still my money. Paid. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. They have to. Yeah. There has well, to there will still band. be. I think that there would still be. Yeah, the two year, we'll three year band. We'll still, you have we'll still to. Be able to yeah, I could. I could see you doing that together with maybe a year band or two year band. But the problem is that if these guys are getting banned, they're like, they oh shit, I don't have a way to make money. That's the big thing. I think taking. That's exactly why it should be in place. They will not do it if they know that this is in place. If they know that, oh, shit, okay, I'm in the UFC. I'm a UFC fighter. Okay, I want to get to that belt. And then, like, two fights in, you think about, oh, man, I'm fighting this one guy. Someone's offering me these drugs. Oh, man, if I take it, I might do this. I might recover quicker. I might get in, you know, I might, I'm might. i going to be the best that I can be. And then once I am there, you know, I'll be able to beat him. But if I do it, I might not ever fight for the title. Oh, shit. No, yeah, I'm not going to do that. To, I think you need to incorporate that with a band because it takes their ability to Oh, definitely, yeah. Fight. They think, okay, for two years, I'm going to be gone. I don't think you just gone. do that because I think a lot of people, a lot of the fighters, if they get caught, they'll be like, oh, well, at least I can still make money. Right. I'm sure, right. but, no, you know, if that. they yeah, – I would think if they do it again, then they should just be cut. Oh, yeah, and if they're taking the stuff, I mean – Obviously, they don't think they're good enough without it to become the champion. So, and honestly, you know, if you ha- if you feel you have to use, this is exactly what I said when Anderson Silva got busted for his shit. You know, he shouldn't have fought. He shouldn't have come back to fight if he felt he had to take, you know, yeah. therapeutic PEDs. Yeah, he regardless. Especially if it was for his leg. If you don't feel like you're healing quickly enough, you don't think your leg is going to be the same. You don't come back. You wait. If you, and if you can never come back, it sucks, so but be you, it. you have to deal with it. Why would you want your reputation tarnished Thank you. just for one fight Thank against Nick Diaz? That's Thank the thing. You. Is a, Another thing, too, is that like if this is just a policy, if they make this policy, I, it will so diminish it because, first of all, the ban on top of never fighting for a title. I could see somebody like Dana being like, you know, or why would they want to fight after that? Or why would they want to fight for us? They would probably be they would their skill would diminish. They wouldn't even try. They would probably be there for a payday. And that's the thing is like exactly. First of all, why would you even still want him employed? And yeah, who would be stupid would enough to piss hot knowing that that was the policy? You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. Why would you still want those guys to fight knowing that they cheat? There's a reason that there's rules for anybody. If you're like work at McDonald's. And, you know, you decide to make it in a certain way that's unhealthy, unbeneficial, and it could get you in trouble, you know, like adding stuff to it or adding – like say say you work at Burger King and to get your customers coming back, you add like addictive uh, like kind of chemicals into the burger and they keep coming back. You know what I mean? And you just you. Yeah, just you're just just the one person making the burgers doing that and then they find out that you did that. Then you get fired. Fired. I mean I, I know that this is men fighting. I'm sure. But see, that's the thing is that, you know, that's the thing. You get fired. If you if you test hot, you should already just be fired. But that's obviously never going to be the case. There are certain fighters that I'm sure that they'll put play favoritism with. They won't do that. So they got to kind of edge that policy a little to where they won't fire somebody if they if they get if they piss hot. But they'll, of, of course, have a, a much more harsher ban, uh, according to them, moving forward. But if that was just the policy, you know, you can't fight for the belt no more. That's like, you know, never. You know, it's like working at a Burger King and, you know, what trying to at some point. You'll ne- then you'll never be managed. You'll never be managed. Never exactly. There's no point working there anymore. You know what I mean? You'll think long term. Right. There's no point in me even being here no more. And if there's no yep. point in you being here, then psh, bye. Bye. Yes. You know what I mean? That's that. If I mean, I think that that policy is that's the that's the toughest way to crack down on it. I, I think uh, I think if they implemented that out of in their code of conduct, 
then that would be I, I think that this wouldn't even be an issue anymore. I'm sure there'd be a lot of fighters that would maybe uh I'm sure that there'd probably be some fighters that come out and say, Hey, you know, I I'm on this, I don't want to piss out. I'm not going to do it no more, or I just can't fight anymore, or I just can't compete anymore, or I've been doing this. I'm not saying a lot of people would do that, but I'm just saying that those are like possible reactions we could see from fighters, you know? I mean, I, I think it's perfect. I think it's. I think it makes so much sense that it hurts my head that it's not even policy right now. It, it's really, it, 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 it's one of the smartest things that I think I've ever heard, and I think it needs to be implemented, and I think we need to send this to the UFC. <laughs> Believe it or not, I think we will. <laughs> I think we will. I, I certainly will. I think what I'm going to do is like I'm probably going to cut and cut this specific part of the podcast and make it its own video so that we can send to people. But that, that's just the thing is that, you know, we need something to crack down on the, on these guys that gets them to understand that you can't do this. It's This is not the sport to be doing that shit, man. It's just not. Yeah, well, no sport like that. It's a sport where your goal is to hurt another person. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, to, to, to hurt somebody beyond, you know, the, the fair abilities. physical limit of a human being yeah. is unfair, un, uh, unrealistically sa- uh, you know, unethical. unsafe. Extremely yeah. unethical. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know. You're just, hurting someone beyond your natural capabilities. And that's not – that's never though. fair. Yeah, exactly. I mean a person knows that they're signing up to fight somebody who is a normal human being and unless you're – and if you're making yourself abnormal in any sense or case, uh, then that's then that's so dangerous, man. Like you're not hitting a baseball. Yeah, and you see guys like Chuck and Mark. You're and, hitting a person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm saying you see guys like Gary Goodridge is probably the primest example. Uh, guys like – and I'm sure back in those days guys were using um, – you know, uh, when they were fighting Gary's Day, which is in the late '90s and early 2000s and stuff, especially in Pride. Um, you know, I'm not gonna say any names because I don't believe I can't, I couldn't really point my finger at any, but I'm just sure that there must have been some. And look at look at Gary now. Look at Coleman. Oh look yeah. At Chuck, look at that, all those guys. In Pride, they said they're not testing and they encourage people to take steroids. So I mean. Oh dear Christ! Did they really say it. that? I gotta talk to Adam because that's just bad. I mean, I've heard it plenty of times. I've heard Rogan say it before, and obviously he knows a lot more. That has been known. That has been established. I didn't know that. I mean, I knew that they didn't test, so. They don't. No, that is known fact. They do not test. They did not test in Japan. They actually encourage the use of performance enhancing drugs because they just wanted somebody to go out there and will almighty ass at all costs. They, Japan was known for professional wrestling, and that's all those guys in Japan used to take steroids, so they just. They were told them to take it, and Rogan said it multiple times on his podcast. So I'm sure he's had he has reliable sources that have well, been I've heard him that. say, you know, I've heard him say, I'll speak on the steroid scandal. I didn't know it was so point blank like that, but yeah, I mean, With that's pride, yes. Yeah. Why do you think uh, Josh Barnett ran to Japan after uh, he tore down a flitch? <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. It's 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 a crazy thing, and you know. I would love it if that was policy someday, and you know, I, I mean, it's a good step to have two to four year ban for sure. I like what Matt Brown's words were, which is essentially the highlight of the entire thing that he said um, in in this interview. I think I believe it was with MMA Fighting or, or or Yahoo, one of those two. If I'm getting it wrong, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to get us in trouble, <laughs> but he um his his the biggest thing that he said was like, if you pop for positive, you should be forgotten about. Which is why he was he was clear on the five year ban. Um, you know, if if like somebody pops, they should be you know cut for five years. Which man, you know, that's basically losing a career essentially. Anyway, it is. That's, yeah. yeah, that's that's career death right there. Five years, you can't make that back up. But there are other there are all kinds of you know careers where like you know no, no matter there are certain rule sets where if you break a rule, your career is over. You know, like if you're a lawyer and you lie to try and uh try and win a case your career is over if you get yep. caught you know what i mean and there's there and, and i think that fighting yeah, should yeah. should especially be the same way uh yeah. you know what i mean that's the thing is that in one of the most dangerous sports in the world because that's what the ufc is you, you know you there needs to be that kind of uh um, uh thing in place Especially for fighters, more so than burger people, more so than even lawyers in some case. Well, maybe not lawyers, because depending on the case, but the you know, it, it, 
there. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's just it's one of those things where so much is on the line, the health. Uh, you know, of course, you know, people do it to advance their careers, but it, they should know that their career should also end for being the kind of shit person who takes drugs to try and win a fight. That's kind of, you know, that's yeah. the thing. And, and I, I think we've done a good job speaking on this. I like to applaud us all. <laughs> it's about, about twelve thirty in the morning here, so. All right, brother. Well, well, all right then. Well, first of all, we want to say thank you to all the fans that listened to this one. This is thank definitely been a long one. Um, UFC 185 going down this Saturday. Uh, I'm gonna watch it. Jonas. Are you watching it? Oh yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I will be watching as well. Awesome. Well then, uh, try and hit me up and we'll watch it. And uh, I'll well, be. What, what was it? I'll be watching it in the comfort of my office. <laughs> um, it's going to be a great card. The main card looks especially tremendous. Each fight leads to something big in each division. Um, it's a very important card, I feel, and I think that um, that it'll it, it could it could easily possibly be event of the year, depending on how the prelim fights go as well. Um, I think all the main card fights end up being great. Uh, I'm excited for this. I'm excited to see where everybody goes moving on from here uh, i want to thank of course the website sports of anarchy.com chris thank you um our sponsors submissionfc.com again sports of anarchy 10 get your 10 percent off the best brazilian jiu-jitsu gear you need some geese go get some they have the hookup and we got 10 percent off do it um of course the flex belt if you want to read more about it please go to sports of anarchy.com um our own chris pagman here did his own review about it and uh, reading it myself, it kind of – he sold me. I kind of want one right now. I wrote uh, the shit out of that review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you can check it out, man. It, it's definitely uh, – it's, def- it's a good read, first of all, and uh, it really gives you a, a – it, it, it gives you a visual sense of what it is uh, you went through with the product, and it sounds great. And so with that, uh, also hit us up on Twitter. I've been getting a lot of good messages from you guys. Uh, I know there were messages uh, for this weekend's podcast, and, and we're just kind of running out of time here. I don't get here. shit. I do. Well, that's because I talk to a lot <laughs> Yeah, well, hit Chris Pagman up. Chris, uh, hit Chris Paliuka. Uh, Chris, C H R I S P A G L I U C A. Yes. Boom! Awesome. Suck it, son. All right, and then, uh, yeah, that's his Twitter handle. Um, uh, and then, of course, hit us up at, at Sports of Anarchy on Twitter. We Facebook MMA discussion does not have uh, Twitter. We have a Facebook. Go on Facebook. If you are on Facebook, hit us up. We have conversations going down every day. Um, and I have noticed that uh, we're getting a lot more comments, a lot more discussions for anybody that listens to the podcast and comments on the page. We love you guys. You guys are awesome. Keep the uh, page growing. If you can, give us some shares. We appreciate it. We love talking to you guys. Um, I'm on there every day, so you know you can hit me up. If you want to hit up Jonas, just message the page, and I'll send the message um, (laughs) to him. Uh, Other than that, uh, we are working on getting – what's his name? Johnny Casey on this podcast. Is that – what's up with that? Johnny Casey, yeah. What's up with that? Um, I – I reached out to his manager who wanted to do it. They were talking about last week, but we never wound up doing it. I, I don't remember exactly what happened. I think they wanted to do it when I was out of town, but um, I'm pretty sure we're going to try to get it done for Sunday. I reached out to his manager. I just haven't heard back yet, and eventually we'll have some other guys from there on. All right, cool. Well, yeah, and, uh, and I've been working on getting a Bellator, former Bellator lightweight champion Daniel Strauss on the podcast. He's agreed to uh come on already he's just uh right now we're working on dates and times he's uh he seems to be busy he's not he's not on as much so <clears throat> so i've gotten in contact with his manager and he's just uh telling me that you know when a when a week opens up where he sees some spots open he'll offer them to us and then uh we'll of course accommodate any time to have dan strauss on of course so um well those are the guests we're working on fun things to come Yes, fun things to come. We're growing, baby. (laughs) We love you guys listening. Appreciate you. Guys, clear out. All right. Thank you guys again. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you guys. We we love y'all, and we hope to uh, keep bringing it to you. Yeah. I'm tired. Later. (laughs)